and Jonathan Balcom, who just spoke on the sentient world of fishes. So I'd like to invite each of them to give just a two minute precy of their talk for those of you that didn't have the benefit of hearing them. And then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, so I'll give my two minute little recap. Um, uh, what I really talked about is, I tried to uh, hopefully motivate people to think about, are people and animals that different? For centuries, basically, we've been saying that uh, humans are unique and superior. Uh, are we unique or are we superior? You know, I would kind of say we have a lot of similarities with fish, a lot of similarities with chickadees. You know, we want to think about you know, how unique are we and what does that mean? Um, and so those are kind of the questions I was asking. And I particularly was interested in the point about superiority. And does that classification of superiority allow us to justify um, acts whereby we say that's uh, inferior? And if it's inferior, does it allow us to justify, however you want to call it, atrocious acts or negative acts against animals? And I ended it by saying we have a desire to categorize groups. And so we're categorizing animals versus humans, chimp versus humans, fish versus humans, chickadees versus humans. We also categorize human groups against each other. And that allows us potentially to do atrocities. If we all kind of considered they're all wonderful groups, then maybe things would be a bit different. So. I wanted to motivate people to think about it, mostly because this is something I've been kind of passionate about for a long time as a cultural anthropologist, or as an anthropologist, I'm a biological anthropologist, and all my cultural anthropologists all disagree with me. So I was just trying to make people think a little bit about it. Well, hi again. So uh, the main premise of my talk was that uh, understanding uh, the environment and natural history is critical into shaping the evolution of different cognitive traits. So in my case, I talked about spatial memory specifically in food caching because food caching is critical for survival, spatial memory is critical for recovering food caches. And so in that way, I'm using chickadees as a model system and trying to understand and show which specific environmental features and selection pressures may be important in, in seeing those differences. I've also argued that uh, and it's very critical. Th that's more important to use ecologically relevant comparisons and comparing multiple species as well to see why species or populations could be different and particular cognitive traits or similar in particular cognitive traits. Uh, and uh, also, I guess I talked about how important to integrate mechanism potentially. And finally, uh, was talking about how important study things in the wild and not in the lab, because when we study things in the lab in wild animals, that's really not necessarily the same thing and we don't know the limitations of this. Uh, I kind of didn't make potentially a connection, but maybe I can use one minute now. So when I talk about neurogenesis in particular, so the biggest bulk of studies in neurogenesis is done on lab mice. And uh, very famous kind of things are that uh, empower or in enrich environmental enrichment, you have heard of it, right? Environmental enrichment improves memory. So if you look at the lab rodents, and if you look what they mean by environmental enrichment, that's actually poorer than anything that could possibly exist in the wild. And so our work actually shows that in the wild, animals don't really raise level of neurogenesis because the idea becomes that neurogenesis in a lab captivity is so depressed by the captive stress environment that when we do enrichment, we're basically trying to recover it rather than see real differences. While animals in the wild conditions actually have normal level of neurogenesis that doesn't vary necessarily as much as what we're seeing there. And there's a ceiling effect, so you could not possibly enrich it more and more. So, and so I kind of showed my, my system with where it's actually, in some systems, it's very, well, not, it's not very easy, but <laughs> it's possible to actually address very complex questions of cognition uh, in, in natural populations under natural conditions. Well, most or probably, possibly all of you were here for my very recent presentation, but since I've been asked to summarize it, I, I gave a sort of a survey of some of the key uh, elements that we might include under the heading of sentience, you know, cognition, emotion, uh, virtue, uh, communication, things like that, uh, in a group, a very large group of animals who are 
routinely underestimated and misunderstood, which is kind of, I think, a common theme uh, in human views of other animals. We, most of us are just often uninformed, um, but, but um, we, the information has been growing and scientists have been asking the right sort of questions and very interesting questions in recent decades that scientists were not asking for some decades before that. Questions about how animals think and how they feel and some of their surprising adaptations that allow them to survive that my co-panelists have presented on earlier. So I went over those and then I put it in the context, the broader context of our hopefully evolving relationship with fishes and uh, talked a little bit about um, some of the problems with our current relationship with them and talked a little bit about also some of the steps we might take to make that relationship better with a particular focus on the, the real nexus of change that needs to happen, which is uh, our eating habits. Thank you. Uh, it occurs to me we have a very distinguished panel here that covers primates, birds, and fishes. And I wonder if I could ask each of you if, if you have any thoughts, uh, any speculations, or uh, to go out on a limb a little bit and think about how what you know connects to things you've heard from the others up here. Then, then uh, you don't have to go out on this, these limbs if you don't want to. If you don't, we'll just turn to questions from the audience. But I wanted to give you a chance first to help us set the scene for the kinds of questions that would be appropriate. Uh, yeah, I have something to say. Just a, an overall theme um, that resonates with the question is that, uh, from my perspective, having delved into the lives of fishes for some years, I've, I've become convinced that um, while the capacities of fishes may not be necessarily always the same as the capacities, emotional, mental, cognitive, et cetera, as, as some of the other animals have been discussed, nevertheless, they, in terms of their diversity and their complexity, uh, they, I, I was going to say rival, I just said it. I don't want it to sound like it's a competition. It needn't be thought of that way. But um, they um, line up very well with the capacities of the terrestrial vertebrates. And I think there's a sort of an underlying message there. I think we tend to, we tend to be a bit biased uh, against, in particularly against uh, creatures who are, because they've evolved in a very different milieu, I'm thinking of fishes now, are very different than us. And, and fishes have had the disadvantage of being literally and metaphorically uh, below the surface of our consciousness, out of our view. We can look out over water and we're, we're, we may be, there may be thousands of fishes within inches of the surface, but we don't see them unless they jump out. And so we've been kind of alienated from that group of animals. And what we see when we, when we learn about the, the cognitive capacities of chickadees or, or, ch or chimpanzees, for instance, or some of the other animals mentioned today, we see that um, there's, there are real parallels uh, between, among them and uh, not necessarily the same cognitive skills. Of course, with fishes, I'm generalizing. You, you were very specific with a very particular group of animals, uh, one, one genus, if not one species, but one, certainly within one or two genera. So whereas I'm talking about a huge diverse group of animals, but within those you, you see capacities that are very, very parallel and very similar, driven by evolutionary need, driven by uh, you know, generations, hundreds, thousands of generations of challenges that the environment uh, imposes on these creatures and they, not surprisingly, evolve very clever, in hindsight, solutions to those problems. Uh, well, in my case, it's also kind of interesting switching the Collins talk because I, I teach in behavior as well, and I teach about cognition. And I always bring this Darwin's phrase saying that the mind of a human is not you know, different of a kind, but it's a, uh, it's, uh, oh, but it's so. In other words, yeah. So the mind of humans is not different in kind; it's just different to a degree. And so, in a way, I always teach this on fishes or birds. It's sort of the same example when we think about the evolution of humans, because first, I also think that it's important to understand that humans are not the pinnacle, uh, because when they, it's been taught in the past, if you look at Aristotle, they always see the scale starting from the lowest 
you know, kind of a creature. So then going to the ways humans are the best evolutionary adapted things. And I always ask my student in terms of the fitness, who do you think is better adapted? A flatworm that lives in our intestines or a human being? And to me, the answer is clear. Flatworm is way more advanced than a human being because they can do way better. Uh, and we cannot do much about that. We're trying, but we've been trying forever, right? And so in a way, when we think about evolution of human mind or sentient, so to speak, it didn't evolve in the empty spot. It actually has evolved from something that's already been there, so some precursors. So when we're comparing animals, we don't necessarily need to say, oh, this is that's another kind of thing. I feel like we shouldn't compare every animal conscious just to that of humans, as long as we're trying to understand where within that scale of evolution they fit. And so they may not be exactly to that same capacity. They may, animals may not remember, chimp may not remember the number of words the human being can, but the mechanism, the principle of this may still be quite the same. And even though we may not understand certain things, I think understanding that connectedness and relations of this continuity of cognition is important. I think that today, at least to me, these two other talks are fitting it kind of really well. And I, I was very happy to see in particular in Colmstock that part of the slides that I show regularly in my annual behavior class. <laughs> So I guess, you know, kind of what I took from these sets of talks is how kind of wonderful these animals are. Uh, 33,000? Yep, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, lots of different species are really, really wonderful, <laughs> amazing uh, animals. And the thing I often think about is I do a lot with conservation. So one thing we all have in common, uh, all three of us is we're watching populations, you know, getting slaughtered. Uh, we're watching humans basically uh, taking uh, species off the face of the earth. Extinction rates is a thousand times higher than it's ever been documented in the past. So I think that's something I, I, I want to kind of think about and try to think about. If they are wonderful animals, uh, we're overfishing you know, everywhere. Uh, we have to kind of think about what are our actions. If we're going to be, you know, some people would like to call us you know, a pinnacle something we're intelligent we have high cognitive abilities how can we do be doing these sorts of things uh, and we are doing them uh, please state your name before you uh, give your question and then if you would please address it to one of the panelists my name is Simon, and my question is directed to Colin Chapman. Uh, since you're doing a lot of conservation, uh, how do you think we can use this knowledge of how uh, of, of what animals know of or how their brains work to conservation, and or how we can use this for conservation tactics? You wonderful question. I think uh, people. Uh, like to uh, empathize. You know, we like to think about how animals are like us. You know, I talked about my corgi, um, and you know, I love my corgi. And people like to think about those sorts of things. And I think if we can make those sorts of connections between humans and the environment, then hopefully things will improve. Um, I always think about arguments, you know, let's eat uh, less fish. And I think about when I talk to the fishermen I, I work with in Africa, and I hate to say it, those fishermen would say, but I don't have money to send my kids to school. And I kept thinking about how I would respond if I couldn't send my kids to school, and I would go get the fish. So we have to start thinking about novel solutions to things, but we have to start having people uh, appreciating uh, wilderness, appreciating wildlife, appreciating uh, the birds, the animals, whatever. Uh, we have to start making things more real for people. Thanks for that. But what I meant is actually how do you think we can use, for, for example, if we know that the elephants uh, can uh, acquire whatever kind of information, how can we use that to, I don't know, it, it's, it's complicated. What I mean is how can we help the animals with what we know that they know. <laughs> yep. Anyway, do, do, do you see where I'm going with that? I, I'm, I'm not telling like, oh, th these animals are beautiful and they're great, so let's try to use that to protect the rainforest, for example. What I'm saying is how can we, 
like directly help on the field the animals so I think, with the um, knowledge that we have of their cognition. Yeah, you know, I'm going to you know, give a lousy answer, then turn it over to my peers to hopefully give a better answer. If I can get thirty thousand dollars from Elephant Tusk, uh, and I'm a, you know, if I can get ten thousand, if I get a year's salary from selling Elephant Tusks as a local villager uh, and send my children to school, I'm going to probably do that. But let's see if you guys have better answers to me. So maybe I, I think I understood your question slightly differently. You're asking how us knowing the cognitive capacity of animals can help us to help these animals, right? That's the question. So, uh, okay, but that, to me, the answer is, well, that, that, that will help us as much as knowing biology, right? So for a lot of conservation efforts, we may use different techniques, let's say relocation or something like this. So I'll take a relocation that's been used very frequently, right? And relocation, uh, frequently has very negative effects because to relocate animals, whether it's prairie dogs or relocate in you know, a population of lion, group of lions, you need to know their biology, you need to understand uh, grouping, you know, association with the environment, do they learn information in there and so, and, or not, right? So in that way, cognition fits, fits in there as well as just understanding biology. The more you understand the animals, the more likely you can help them if you're trying to help them, which are two different questions, right? One is, do we want to help the animals? Maybe we just want to eat all the animals and, you know, it doesn't matter. So uh, you hear from people and hunters, and so I agree with you. I mean, I know in my case, a uh, little bit I hear from my old past where the Siberian tiger, one of the very magnificent animals, is disappearing. And there's a lot of money goes into the Russia and uh, northern China to protect it. So local people are still killing it. Well, but they're killing it, A, they sell stuff, right? And B, they're, they're destroying their livelihood, the only one they have, right? So they, they may be smart as animals, but when they come to your backyard and killing your cows, you're gonna kill them, right? Because they're poor. And so in a way, one way to save animals is to eliminate poverty, but now we are getting into the completely <laughs> different uh, uh, world. But, but again, but I, I feel that understanding cognition definitely helps to understand in the efforts that humans want to undertake because that may be very important. If we don't understand this and we do something, that may hurt animals rather than help them uh, on the level of uh, sophistic sophisticated cognition that animals can have, just as well as you know, all parts of their biology that we need to know. Yeah, I, I'll repeat an example I gave a couple of days ago that's, I think, re very relevant to your, your question, the specifics of your question, which is uh, how, how might we leverage animals' cognitive capacities to help protect themselves and, and advance their own conservation? It's something that I think is not being uh, looked at much, but it's an idea I had a few years ago, and I did some research, reached out to some groups, and there was interest, but it never took off. And it's a controversial idea of uh, using a, a natural behavior, a phenomenon that's been observed in wild chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, most people maybe were here when I mentioned this the other day, but some people weren't, so I'm mentioning it again, and it's very pertinent. Um, they have been documented uh, deactivating poacher snares in the wild. And uh, in those areas where they're doing it, incidents of losses of limbs and digits and other maimings are significantly lower. So it is actually definitely helping their, these local populations where this phenomenon is being observed. So I was thinking, you know, what, what about the idea of actually schooling or training other populations of, of, of wild primates who, where this phenomenon has not taken up, it has not happened yet, it may never happen. You know, these are sometimes chance events. Um, either putting videos in the wild where they can watch videos and learn from them or training a, a, an individual in captivity to, to safely deactivate a snare and then having them act as models for other wild, wild ones. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, well, a few facilities in Africa where chimpanzees, for instance, are in way stations where they've been orphaned or they've been otherwise victims of human interference and they're introduced back to the wild. So there is that actually potential to train, to have knowledgeable individuals go back if it's an area where there's poaching, of course, and then act as teachers, if you like, and others could learn that and the, the, the knowledge would disseminate throughout the population. And given that females migrate to other other groups, other populations, maybe it could spread through the region. Anyway, it's a, it, it might be seen right now as a pie in the sky idea, but I think it's a, it's a kind of concept and an approach that, that would be worth looking at for some species that might be suitable and effective. 
I just, I want, just want to add also think some group of people that I know in University of Wyoming, they study cognition of raccoons and coyotes. They just publish a review and behavior from the cognitive thing, right? Because there's a nuisance animals, uh, but it doesn't mean that we should ignore them or we should drown them like that uh, teacher, unfortunately, and everybody thought it was okay, right? Uh, but the point is if we're trying to control them, their cognition is very critical because these are very smart creatures things like raccoons, right? So it's not a simple thing. The same thing where we work, we work with black bears, and I firsthand, because I try, even though we won uh, <laughs> our battle, we know that they're incredibly smart and incredibly powerful animals. And every time we have encounters when animals suffer, it would be because people don't understand that. So the famous case in Lake Tahoe was when this woman, it's illegal to feed the bears, but there was this one woman who lived in Lake Tahoe who fed them anyway, and because she felt they're like pets, they're very nice, and until when one day she didn't have enough food and she got attacked by the very bear that she fed because she had some food in her pockets, right? So again, I think understanding cognitive level of animals that we are trying to help to, even when they're nuisance animals, not lions or elephants, is still very critical because their cognitive abilities are critical in how they interfere or how they deal with us. And so if we are trying to protect them, but at the same time, uh, reduce the negative impact. In other words, we're trying to negate this, you know, or you know, ameliorate their conditions between uh, humans and animals. Again, understanding cognition is very important. So in that group in Wyoming, they do amazing stuff looking at uh, how raccoons solve problems, how to get all these things is absolutely amazing. And, and so are coyotes. And yet it's sad to hear in this country, we have these coyote hunts where people are competing how many coyotes can they shoot for absolutely no reason. Uh, which to me is a truly sad state of affairs uh, when animals are viewed as basically objects that don't that are here for our pleasure. Yeah. I'd like to get to your question, but I wonder if you would let me ask Colin first to respond to Jonathan's idea about training primates in the wild to help their own <laughs> conservation cause. Um, I think it's a really good idea in principle. Uh, in practice, um, you put a computer screen in the forest, you know, every villager is going to be stealing that as fast <laughs> as they can. They'll be chopping down tropical forests to steal it. Uh, you need to put out snares for them. So they... Well, snares for people. No. That would work. <laughs> I agree. People. <laughs> um, Joking. We have to think of really practical ones. And what, what's interesting about that statement is it's a good idea based on kind of what we could could do, but we need to combine good ideas with ideas that'll work. Um, and uh, there are ways of doing similar things. I'd have to really think about how to do that. But I think you're right in that some chimps and some gorillas are now taking them off. How we propagate that, I don't know, but you're, you have a good idea, logistics would be hard. But that doesn't mean it's, we shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. First step. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I wanted to build on Colin's comment, but also address Vladimir's uh, mention that indeed, uh, when it comes to coyotes, know that even in Montreal, we are trapping them and nobody's reacting much to that until a dog or a cat gets caught. We have to wait for that to happen. But, and, and you're right, the cognition that we found out on coyotes is very helpful in trying to mitigate whatever risk is perceived that we have urban coyotes now in towns. And if only the same amount of money that was put in trying to come up with strategies to eliminate them was put in strategies to coexist, we wouldn't have any issue anywhere. But uh, just going back to Colin's statement. Um, what is your name? Oh, sorry, I, I apologize for that. Mireille Goulet, sorry about that. Um, in terms of conservation or how we can use the knowledge to help that in many ways. I think that it, it, it does help to have the knowledge and understand better, but I, I find it hard to believe that it would make any change into preserving species because I understand the issue to be very much an issue related to poverty. And I think the, the cause at the root of the problem is very much socioeconomic rather than a lack of knowledge. I guess uh, I kind of think it's both. Um, so we have to solve some of the economic things, some of the poverty things. 
But I remember talking to a colleague of mine um, who kind of got his PhDs in, in the late 1950s. Um, and he kind of was teaching island bio biogeography. And he said, I, you know, he said, I don't teach conservation, I teach island biogeography. And I turned around and said, what do you call fragments? Dispersal between fragments. And he kind of looked at me and kind of looked at me. And it was good pause. He looked at me again. He probably didn't look that long. And he realized the value of his scientific knowledge. And he, he you, well, this is when I was at the University of Florida, and he taught for the next six years of my conservation class because that was a piece of knowledge that we didn't know we needed in conservation. And so sometimes we don't know what we need to know. Like often we don't know what we need to know. And so, you know, those sorts of things are really, really valuable. Uh, animal cognition, I also think, is something that connects people to animals. And, you know, we're not uh, swaying necessarily the minds of people, we're swaying hearts. Uh, and, you know, I'm a, you know, biologist who kind of works kind of solely in facts. My partner is an artist who works solely outside of fact. Well, I shouldn't say that totally, but she works outside of facts. Um, I'll have to think about how to say this, though. You can watch this. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we have to think about how to sway minds uh, and hearts of people. And we're not going to say it by telling them metabolic rates or something. We're going to sway it by showing similarities like between animals and humans or making people empathize with animals. Hi, uh, my name is Pascal. Um, it's actually like uh, related to what you just said uh, when I wanted to ask you guys. So changing be people's behavior is a very difficult thing. And on top of it, like people's relationship with food is very emotional. Like it's one of the few things that you put inside your body like three times a day, which makes it even more difficult. So, um, and I doubt, I really doubt that rational arguments would change behavior. Uh, same as uh, seeing things on TV or like people like they don't connect with that, it seems. So um, what solutions could you come up with like to to make people emphasize. Like personally, I think that if people would get the occasion to kill an animal actually before they eat it, it would really like, it, you feel something and it changes your relationship with food, but perhaps that's a bit extreme. But so, yeah, wonder what your, your opinion is. I'd like to comment on that uh, first, at least. Um, as a science writer, a popular science writer, somebody who writes books that are tailored not for scientific readers per se, although I, I hope that my books are enjoyable for scientists as well, but non-scientists, uh, I've learned the lesson somewhat the hard way that the science alone is not often going to make a good read. Uh, the science is effective for getting to hear, uh, for getting information in people's minds, but in terms of engaging the emotions, uh, stories uh, are much more powerful for that. Uh, and so I've learned to include um, personal accounts. I didn't really share any today. I kind of tailored this audience to the theme of the conference, the fact that it was a scientific venue, not maybe not exclusively a science audience, but a lot of scientists in the audience. And so um, I didn't, uh, so that, so, but, but I've learned that in, in my science writing that if I don't include dialogue and stories and, and nonfiction can have dialogue. I learned that in a creative nonfiction writing class. So uh, the, apropos your, your question in terms of galvanizing people into changing maybe their behavior or thinking we need change, I think if you can reach the heart, then, you, you know, figuratively the heart, I think it's still all going on up here, uh, then I think you're better <laughs> positioned to... Uh, affect change and motivate people to change them to change their behavior because emotions are very powerful things and if people can feel uh, moved then I think they're more ready to act but I mean I agree with you there in terms of I mean because when we are so used to buying things we have no we never think and I could catch myself the same way when you go to a supermarket you buy meat you don't think where it comes from and actually if you think about the treatment of animals uh, in the U.S., assuming the same in Canada, just if anybody has seen how the chickens are maintained, then the horror story, at least to me, would be like, uh, it's a crazy horror story, right? So, And so if people would have to kill their own animals, 
I do think that it probably would change somebody's mind. Maybe not everybody. Hunters do hunt. And they, but again, there's a hunting for food and there's a hunting for pleasure, right? That's something about human mind that we still need to understand when people feeling um, empowered to use a power rifle and go with a guy to Africa and shoot a lion from two miles away when there's no danger to that person. There's no risk. I personally, I don't see any nobility in shooting the animal because there's just, just anybody can do it. It's no different than playing a video game and yet people do that, right? So how do you get that uh, policy out and in a way a lot of it probably will go to education education and family including us right so a lot of us growing up in a particular family environment would probably contribute a lot to how we treat animals having pets so if you grow up with pets you probably have much more empathy because in the end that's empathy not just understanding physiology uh, because a lot of animals a lot of scientists that study animal cognition or behavior probably would you know would slaughter rats by thousands and you know within a few weeks and they they don't feel any different uh, uh, and i'm not saying they should or should not feel any different but it is a thing right so in myself who's done neuroscience i know that uh, sacrificing animals has always been very difficult and it's always taken a very serious consideration when and how many should I compromise in certain scientific decisions in, in my particular career were rejected because I wouldn't I'm, I wouldn't be willing to to do more than potentially I could get scientific result right but it's a very complex question I think uh, I, I agree with both panelists that uh, it's not it's not just knowledge it's, it's definitely empathy toward animals but how do you get this to people uh, and I think it starts really early from our development from family uh, to education in school and to all this experience, right, in the society in which we, we, we grow. I'll just add kind of one thing to that. Think about your parents. Um, did they have the opportunity to basically go to the green store, you know, which is basically sell, you know, sell, sold, you know, kind of food that was more appropriately grown? Or did they know if they could buy things locally? All those are changes that have happened very, very recently, you know, um, so I think we should think about the positive as well as the negative. So we are moving in the right direction. And things I think are really improving, we just got to speed them up a bit. Um, just to move that cursor across the screen a little bit more. Thank you. Could, could I just follow up with a question and then we'll get to yours? Um, do you anticipate that uh, the force of the state and the law will come into play here? And if it does, will, should we anticipate violent reactions? So we know that uh, trying to give rights to women and immigrants uh, evokes very strong anti-sentiment in a big part of the population. And if you take people's hamburgers away from them, should you anticipate people showing up with guns <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it has to be done, like I recall, it has to be done slowly through education. You cannot do it once, but then again, I mean, uh, more European countries are more advanced in that way. Uh, but they need to be explained. Public, our, I think part of our job as, as scientists is education, and, and, uh, and it's not an easy way, right, to communicate our work to general public. It's much easier to write, you know, whatever, 10 papers a year in a highly specialized journal and, and feel very happy about that. But that doesn't, that's not going to change opinions no. of people. Yep. Uh, but providing alternatives of different foods uh, and, and constantly educating people slowly, I mean, we are evolving slowly. We, we are not uh, a drosophila or a chickadee, right? So it takes a long time to change. It takes generations to change. So if somebody grew up, they will say, I grew up when my, 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 my father was hunting, my dad was hunting, we cut all the trees and nothing happened. Everything's going to be just fine. That, you know, only new generation can change that. So the only way we can do is, I mean, it's a battle for new minds, for new generations of, of people that can change it. I'm just too small for this microphone, <laughs> sorry. Pull it um, out. Just pull it out, pull it out. Oh, no, you can no, pull I it. need to go up. No, you can just go like this. Okay, but that's okay. You hear me fine, right? Um, I've got one comment, which is a quote from a French uh, philosopher. 
he said, uh, talking about education and how this is a, a big challenge, we need to manage ignorance. And this is not something we are used to. We, in education and science, we don't manage ignorance. But ignorance is there. And to know that you are ignorant, you need knowledge. So ignorance is therefore a quality that never knows itself, right? To know you ignore something, you need a bit of knowledge. So I think this is a, a perspective we have not explored. I heard a little bit uh, t uh, talk about ignorance. What is done to the animal is not known by uh, the one consuming the animal. And I I'm thinking about maybe there is some way to approach this problem from the ignorance point of view and educational point of view. Because there is real effort being put into the information of the corporation and farming system to not see the harm done in animals. Because we do have this intuitive system of empathy that we place ourselves at, at, at the place of the animal. When you fish, uh, this anecdotal was uh, very compelling. This is how we become vegan. We have this bad experience once, and it starts us thinking. But I think there is real effort, energy, and money being put in retaining this information from the consumers. Maybe that could be a, a way to make people a little bit more conscious and to, to make them realize they are ignorant, right? Because usually when you see this, this huge industrial farm, it gets you thinking, is that, is that right? Is that good, right? But those images are not on the package of the, of the chicken. Maybe we should force those, right? When you, spoke, when you smoke now, there's an ugly picture of, of a, a mouth very sick and uh, with cancer. Maybe that should be a way, like a freedom of information type of campaign. I know there's going to be resistance, but from my experience, most of the vegan I know have started from those, uh, those little experiences that got you thinking, right? The very first realization, oh my god, I did ignore that part. And then you can start learning. So I don't know if the management of ignorance should be a way we have not explored yet. And it could be, from legal point of view, educational point of view, be explored by a more, a more um, philosophical perspective. A comment on that. I, I, I tend to think of the world as glass half full. Um, I, I feel like Stephen thinks of it as half empty, but that's just my sense. I may be wrong. But uh, my glass half full mind says uh, I'm encouraged by the development of technologies that are allowing us to, allowing everybody, or not everybody, but a great swath of the human population to witness, if they wish, what goes on in factory farms, what goes on in slaughterhouses, what goes on in various human animal operations uh, through video, the internet, drones that now are do flyovers of places where the gates are locked. You're not allowed in there, but you can fly. You know, maybe they don't want you flying your drones over, but people are doing it. They're documenting and they're making it available through public forums. And what do we see? I mean, I, I think we are, well, while the, the, the direction is still the wrong one in terms of global consumption of humans because of growing human populations and efforts to westernize diets, how ironic, just as Western diets are beginning to shift. But I'm, I, I think that the turning point will come and, uh, and I think that these technologies will help to do that through undermining ignorance, through the availability of information. I think actually we, uh, put overemphasis on ignorance. Most people know kind of the abuses we're doing. We know we're you know, doing horrible things. Yeah, yeah be, be, if we know the details, it'd be better, but we know what we're doing. And so what is the important thing to me is to motivate people to do something different. And that's what we're not doing. There, there's, very, there's ignorance a little bit, but mostly it's lack of motivation. We know what we're doing. I'm not sure I agree about that. <laughs> uh, Pick a topic and see if people disagree. <laughs> you're, you're all familiar with the, with the social psychological notion of cognitive dissonance. And it's not, cognitive dissonance is not a, a contradiction. You know, it's raining and it's not raining. 
it's it's a contradiction not between two affirmations, two propositions, but between two desires. I want this and I want that, but in a very par paradoxical situation. And to, to simplify with uh, with uh, Jonathan's hamburger, I want to I want to eat my hamburger, but I don't want to think I'm a monster responsible for the horrors. So what's the solution? Stop eating the hamburger? No, don't look at the horrors. The, and what, so the, the challenge, that's, not, that's a special kind of ignorance. We want to sensitize people. So in, English, in French, we say sensibilisation. And, and you're right, Jonathan. By the way, so let something, so something personal straight. Yes, by nature, I'm kind of a, a, a cynic and a skeptic. But on this particular question, which I consider to be the for my for my life the most important question which is animals as victims i don't give in for one microsecond to skepticism I'm as, I'm as optimistic as you can possibly be even if i don't really believe it because because their only hope is that the optimism is right if i if i it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if i say just people are horrible they don't care even if you tell them they're not going to do anything about it i can't believe that so anyway so i believe in sensibilization and the enemy in that is ag gag i don't think youtube has yes there's a lot of awful stuff on youtube but people don't because of cognitive dissonance they don't go to look at what's on youtube so it's, that's not enough ag gag is hiding things from us horrible things and there's two things, but there's two things that we're concerned about, right? Uh, um, um, Colin's main concern, and possibly also uh, Vlodya's, is uh, more in the area of uh, protecting nature, whereas I think Gary's and Jonathan's is at least as much in protecting the domestic creatures that were that were that were breeding for a horrible fate for no reason. Both of these need to be brought to people's um, consci consciousness, they have to see it and they have to feel it. I'll give it, I'm going to stop because I, I think there are enough questions, but the reason I invite in, I invited three oxytocin people was because one hypothesis is that within all of the mammalian line, and now I hear it's also avian, um, the affinity, for example, between mates and between parents and children and vice versa is mediated by certain hormonal um, agents or, or, or uh, yeah. Um, but of course I was in a tremendous contradiction because to, in order to find that out, horrible things were done to voles. And in fact, I've been, I've been criticized for that. Uh, I don't know how to split the difference uh, it was brought up in another one of these sessions where they said, uh, and it's, it was a cynical argument, how if, 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 if fish are sentient, and there are people who don't believe that they're sentient, but they are sentient, and you try to stop us from doing research on them, how are we going to prove that they're sentient? So in other words, people use research as a justification for, uh, for doing the kinds of things that they're perhaps trying to show are wrong to do. So I want to close, none of that, those are all just uh, conversation topics. I want to close with a, a question for Vlodya in particular. You expressed some sympathy for the sake, for the, for the fate of your, of your um, bird subjects. You, for example, you released them rather than, than killing them at the end. You expressed sympathy for, for uh, cons conservation issues, and you even said that there were forms of experimentation that you re rejected doing. What is your criterion? Uh, <laughs> it's a very hard question, right? And I'm probably as hypocritical as anybody else uh, in many ways uh, where I draw the line somewhere that is a very subjective uh, rather than being objective because uh, in certain ways I'm, I, I'm more empathetic to the subjects I study, birds or things, you know, other animals like dogs, right? Or bigger animals that we view as more sentient in a way, right? And then at the same time not maybe feeling or experiencing the same thing toward rats uh, and, and, uh, and mice. So I, but at the same time, I'm aware of these issues, right? And in and, and, and some ways we're becoming desensitized with this. So I'm, for example, you know, just, just seeing a lot of experiments with mice we know, right? So the mice is being slaughtered by hundreds of thousands daily, probably for a lot of experimentations and rats. 
And yet, at the same time, if you look at rat cognition, actually rats, as far as I know, can do anything that any corvid can do. Uh, and corvids are feathered apes, so the mice are also must be uh, haired apes <laughs> or rodent apes, right? Uh, so, <laughs> yes, <laughs> featherless apes. I call them featherless corvids. So uh, we could call this, right? So, but yeah, I mean, it's um, uh, yeah. Sometimes it's it's a, it's a kind of a hypocritical dialogue within yourself where you're willing to. Okay, <laughs> but I, I just feel as a scientist, uh, there is certain responsibility that we have in order to decide what we do, why we do it, and and what's the benefit uh, of doing certain things. Uh, but, but it's a hard question, kind of, and I think everybody has to kind of answer to them, to herself, himself, why are they doing this, and, and feel are they comfortable with this, with this solution? Because even though I know I talk more about wildlife and conservation, but I am as engaged in pets because I, I have dogs, and always, and I am very disillusioned the way that at least the Western society treats in the U.S. Right, where people take dogs as little toys and then they throw them out, uh, and if you look at how many dogs are in shelters or people just take them because they're cute and they have no idea. And then you see these dogs being euthanized when they're just a year old. Uh, that, that is pretty sad because, again, people don't feel that they are, or they just give them up. They just take them for a year and then it's like, oh, okay, I just, we just throw them out. Uh, and, and having pets is a very big responsibility. So I'm, I'm happy to see where we live in Reina. There are a lot of these no-kill shelters. So there's more trying to... And, and, on responsible breeders do not sell pets to people just like I know we have Shiba Inu, so there's I know you like you like uh, corgis, and I think corgis are amazing, <laughs> but Shiba Inus are special, right? So they are most closely it's related to them. they're most closely related to wolves, and they we love them, right? And so when I'm a biologist, I, st I work with animals all my life. So for the when we first time, it was a year, number of years ago, we wanted to buy. Uh, uh, you know, pop Shiba Inu. We were inter my wife and I, who both are biologists, both PhDs. We had to go through an hour interview about why do we want to have this dog? What do we have for this dog? And you know, I was offended initially, but then I thought that's actually not a bad idea, right? So that I actually appreciate this to a degree. So, <laughs> so this comes back to my question about the power of the state. You need to have a training session and a license to have a pet. Do you need to do that to have a child? <laughs> and if we, th we think about right. the number of us around, maybe that, that's a place to start. So I see that there are lots of people and uh, we're roughly halfway through the session, if I'm not mistaken, and I want to make sure that we... I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak and we've had plenty of our chances. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is just state your question and we'll, after everyone has had a chance to ha get their voice heard, then I'd like the panel to pick up whichever questions they find of most interest to them. <laughs> yeah, so write them down, folks. <laughs> I forget, I forget them too. <laughs> So uh, my question is for Vladimir. Um, I was really, I thought your discussion of the way in which visual cues might be playing a role in uh, chickadee memory was really interesting. And I was just curious to know, um, do you think there's some role for, like there's some sort of inference being made here? Or is it just uh, some kind of more associative effect with the actual visual environment? Good answer, we should wait for it. Yeah, so I actually would like you to write that one down and uh, after everyone has spoken, then we'll we'll go go to that one first. It's actually a common sh should I say it anyway? Yeah, okay. Uh, regarding veganism, and uh, this is something I already talked about earlier in this uh, this week, uh, and I think that there is a much bigger picture regarding animal uh, welfare and our education through that, because obviously, if you think about uh, pastoralists that rely on on animal for food or any population that rely on on fish or, or sea mammals for food what do you do with them do you just tell them okay just stop hunting fish because they are sentient i don't think you can do that maybe you could do that if land was available and they could grow food plant-based food and there was enough for everyone but on the trend that we're on right now the trend i'm talking about is overpopulation 
And overpopulation is not the problem, I think. The problem is that we're consuming like crazy and that we're throwing away so much food that on that trend, we cannot ask everyone to just give, give away all of this animal food. And as I said, something, it's something that I did bring up earlier. Uh, what do you do with all of the infrastructures and the, the space that you need for growing plant-based food if you just from day one to day two, stop using this, the, these animals as food? That's a question, not a comment. Well, it's, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're next. Yeah. Um, since we're talking, about, about, uh, we're talking a lot about connecting people to animals, uh, finding sim similarities between us and them, um, and even if we tried to avoid uh, anthropomorphism, uh, since the beginning of the week, there's still a lot of comparison and analogies that are being made. And I wonder what is the role of, of uh, alterity and divergence between us and other, other species, even in the education of the public? Why, um, why wouldn't we... Uh, uh, educate people to uh, not fear alterity, but to, to say that even if there, there aren't lots of similar similarities, uh, those living things can still exist, you know? Because I, I, I was thinking of, um, by example, of Jaws and all the, the famous predators uh, of the world that we are kind of glad that they die at the end and we wanted the poor little animals, the vegetarian ones, to, uh, to survive. And I feel like we always identified ourselves to the more uh, uh, passive animals and uh, that we found a great alterity with the, the predatory ones. But uh, yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> Okay, question about alterity and coming to love the other and respect it and not trying to make analogies to the human species. I think you're next. Um, my question is, um, should we educate scientists uh, about animal well-being before we educate population? Because uh, in, there's a lot of domain of science and sometimes they have this argument that they just uh, want to stay in their lane. So if here I'm being sensibilized about animal cognition, but if I were to talk to a nutritionist after that, he may actually tell me that veganism, for example, is not a sustainable uh, lifestyle. So how do you, um, I guess, how do you match the main of science that don't always get along? Uh, my name is Najed Sarab, and I had actually a comment on the uh, uh, ignorance and uh, uh, sensitizing people. But first, I wanted uh, to come back on the argument that Colin gave um, about fishermen. If we stopped eating fish, that would harm their, like it's like the source of income for them. But I often hear this comment, and my response is, so what about uh, drug? trafficking. Also, I'm sure the drug trafficking network, there are a lot of hardworking parents who want to send their children to school. Does it mean that so we do not do anything about it? But it's m more of a rhetorical question. But my um, other comment was on uh, what we said earlier, what I think, well, in Arabic, um, a person, human being, could be translated to the one that forgets. And I think this is something that we do a lot, we forget. So um, unfortunately, I'm surrounded by a lot of non-vegan people. And when I talk to them, I feel that at the moment, they are really sensitive to that and they are willing to do uh, some changes. But then a week after, a month after, they, they, they forget. So, and that's why a lot of religions are based on repetition. You have to repeat again and again and again until it becomes a habit because we are creatures of habit. But 
I think it's more of forgetting than being ignorant because it's impossible to be ignorant even. Uh, so yeah, that was my comment. Thank you. OK, so my name is Jeremy. Uh, anyone, this question is directed at everyone, I guess. Um, it's sort of similar to what's been already asked, but I was just wondering what your opinions are on what the best way is to deal with a reactionary response to animal-related activism. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mario, and I would like to make a comparison. Um, the senses, we have senses, animals have senses, and my understanding is that animals tend to um, react before us to um, like earthquakes and stuff like that. Do they still possess a sense that we lost? And could we have a sense that they don't have as much for the, the feeling thing and the cognition? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you have a question? Please. Oh, I, I have many questions, but <laughs> I also have a comment. Uh, my name is Catherine, and um, yeah, so I think we all have to take multiple approaches, even so we have maybe one profession where we already help animals, but I think act we have to be act like activists all the time. Um, and about education, we should start as early as possible. And um, what I found with the area I'm working in is confirmation bias, that those groups, are like closed groups and Everybody is just telling the other person, yeah, that's good what you're doing. And it's very hard to break through that. And uh, so maybe you have ideas. <laughs> I know it's a horrible question, but <laughs> yeah, I thought I, yeah, because I'm, I'm also saying that because it took me a long time to understand that people, those people, I, this area I work in, actually, the, they, they are very sure of, that they are right about what they are saying, even so it sounds unreasonable. What, the and what do they say? <laughs> it's animal <laughs> research. Um, and when you, there are some propaganda websites uh, for animal research um, where you, where every single experiment is justified. And you just think, okay, that's ridiculous because if you read the, read the literature, you know that's, most so many um, preclinical animal studies are not translatable, for example, but still they are so sure they they just defend it so hard and and I just thought okay i that that must be a lie because they cannot really believe this, but I actually now think they must believe it because it's confirmation bias, so yeah, I, but I don't know how to what to do about that. And what is your professional formation? I'm a veterinarian. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that asked questions and to the panel for their forbearance and patience. I'd like to invite those of you that did ask questions to hang around the microphones. And as we take up your questions, feel free to follow up, OK? Jonathan, would you like to start? I didn't write them all down, so forget <laughs> it. You wrote some of them down. So <laughs> I'm just going to want them to repeat. Uh, I'm sorry to be not efficient. I know LA Zone, the gentleman back there asked the first question. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Simon? Simon? Well, Simon, thank you for raising the, uh, the topic of human population. Uh, it's so often not in the dialogue in whatever domain it's in. It's, it's sort of like it's a classic elephant in the room. And so many of the world's problems, if not all of them, in terms of human-based problems, stem or relate to that issue I think some some say that's not that's not really a, a the problem or an issue or a problem I think it's a huge one we have to come to grips with our own uh, breathing output and uh, and find ways of restraining ourselves um, so I'm sure there's as many opinions in the room about how to do that or whether we need to do that as there are people in the room but so that's not really an answer but I'm glad you I'm glad you raised that point well, actually, I, I don't think overpopulation is the direct problem. I think it's our habits that are the problem. And because we are so many in the world, that creates other problems. I don't think that if we're 
seven billion people, if, if, if we had a sustainable way of life, which is basically no capitalism, I think, uh, no overconsumption, no, uh, no, no uh, you know, we throw away so much food and we, we, we cut down so many trees and we don't use uh, sustainable energy, stuff like that. So I don't think it's the direct problem. I think that it's, anyway. It's, it's hard I think to it tell. exacerbates all the other problems. But just, just a statistic that relates to what you just said. I, I heard recently we throw out in America, I don't know about Canada, probably similar, about 40% of all edible it's huge. food. It's huge. It's huge. I'm going to kind of jump in and kind of respond as well. Um, I think when we talk about some of these issues, we really have to think about, okay, there's us in North America, Europe, wherever we want to think about. And then there's the rest of the world. So I can't talk about the rest of the world, but I can talk about Africa. I've worked in Africa for almost 30 years. And the perspective there is just very, very different. You know, human rights for, you know, maybe. You know, animal rights, kind of. Human population growth, not a problem. You know, it's 3% per year. You know, so we really need to switch around and think about our reality and the world's reality, and they're different. You know, if you walk up to a neighbor's cow and just, you know, hack it with a machete until it's dead, the cow, the neighbor's going to say, can you give me some money for that? It's not a question. So let's think about things in a, a more global perspective. And that was a bit of extreme. And it was extreme to hopefully, hopefully make some people react. But, you know, uh, we, we, we live in a little bit of a glass bubble. You know, you're not going to be a vegan in Uganda. I agree with that. And let's add something to the problem. Climate change. And I've seen a picture of how Earth would, would, like, would look like in, uh, in, two, in, yeah, well, let's say 80 years, where most of the land won't be habitable anymore. So we're already overpopulated. So let's restrain even more of the territory that we have. So... You know, if we want to, to, to make everyone vegan, I think we have to, to solve a few problems before that. And I'm not saying that we should ignore that problem during that time, but there are a lot of other issues that we should look at before that. I have to say something about cognitive dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to promote it. This is, a, this is a classic example of cognitive dissonance. The proposition here is, that the prosperous, uh, um, um, a wealthy part of the world that's already somewhat sensitized and contemplating it should become vegan. And what do we tell ourselves as an excuse for not doing it? Well, the Bushmen in Africa won't become vegan. <clears throat> no, I think that's different. I think we should become vegan and we should think about how to change attitudes, how to respond to what's the reality of the world. So of course we should do more ourselves. Because our consumption rate is, is you know, 10 times, 20 times higher. But all my Ugandan field assistants, they want to buy a motorbike. They want to increase their consumption rate. So I think we have to think about both realities. We definitely have to do more ourselves, for sure. But we also got to think about how to make uh, the reality uh, of kind of balance. So we have to basically say, OK, we got to do more, but we have to help the world do more. If we do more and they don't, and I'm you know, basically talking about parts of Africa. And we should add that we can't, in, if it doesn't really have a relation to, well, it could have a, a relation to animal cognition. For developed countries that are, you know, switching practices gradually, we can tell them, oh, you should stop polluting because we did that and we know what it leads up to. Well, I am already. <laughs> As the moderator, I'm a little worried that uh, I'm not doing my job because people are speaking and I'm sure people online can't hear them because they're not at the microphone. So I'm just going to ask you to uh, not stop speaking, but just go to the microphone uh, to say something so everyone can hear you. 
Vladimir, did you hear a question that you'd like to talk about? Uh, I mean, there was a short question directly to me about visual uh, visual information and whether animals are is this associative learning. So. The short answer is yes. I mean, I do think it's associative learning, but I also think that a lot of learning that we humans do is associative learning. So every time we talk about things like insight learning and everything else, it, to me at least, it's it's nothing but a, a compilation or build up on lots and lots of different associative learning paradigms. With a classical example, with the caller's chimp, when they were they were uh, putting the box and climbing and uh, get the banana, and they were well, they were compiling these things. The chimps knew these pieces separately before, so they can put them together. But again. I, in that way, I, I, I'm not down on associative learning. I think associative learning is the foundation of all learning for everything. And the more you build this associative learning, the more likely you can do something with this. Uh, because I've not met any humans who has never seen a car and was asked to be a mechanic, and they just looked at the vehicle and said, like, oh, here it is. You know, it's just like, you know, duh, I know how to solve this, right? That's not going to happen. And so, yeah, it's just, but I do think it's just a learning, and I cannot really say more uh, about this uh, because it's, very difficult to to understand uh, what else may 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 animals do, right? So, and I I know it's going to take more time for other things, but I want to bring a few other things, examples too. And what we see and what animals see are not the same thing. And a classical examples from from uh, classic ethology go with this, right? When uh, animal fights, like classical example when Amer when a European robin, which is a bird with a red breast, when it sees its rival, it will attack it, right? So and if you see this, you will interpret this so that bird sees the other bird as a bird and as a rival and it attacks it. But then at the same time, if you just take a piece of cloth and you'll paint it orange and you'll put, throw it in the same territory, it will be attacked just as viciously, right? So it's just a piece of cloth, but the bird responds exactly the same way. So there's still also something in the animals responding to particular stimuli. Uh, and viewing those and perceiving them slightly differently. And so we just have to be careful as well when we're interpreting this because we may interpret things one way, but the animals may interpret them there differently. The outcome may be the same, but the process is different. So if if you ask the question and you don't hear us addressing it, please reapproach the microphone and ask it again. I'd like to pose to all of you the question about alterity. And I took that question to sort of uh, say, look, we don't need to make animals like us in order to appreciate them. We should appreciate them in their differences. And some of their differences are that they're just predators. <laughs> they have to eat meat. Um, so I took the question, please uh, refine it or correct it if I got it wrong. I took the question to be, uh, are we, over anthropomorphizing, would we be better served to avoid some human-like terms for animal mental states? And that's one question. And what do we do about predation? Should we wipe out other species that are meat eaters? Can I can I just request to ask for a definition of alterity? I've heard that word before, and I, I don't know the meaning of it. Alterity. Well, what is fundamental? not the same alterity like not linearity between the behavior between the traits anything at all okay and what yeah otherness. yeah otherness thank you and what i was thinking about um is mostly that trying uh to find uh similarities and to connect between we are this way also i find in dangerous because everything that is otherness becomes suspect you know and i find that uh, education uh, sort of um take only in account what uh, are the similarities and doesn't focus on on uh, otherness on uh, alterity and difference But I also think that uh, I think to eliminate entirely animal consumption may not be the final goal. So again, when we talk about Bushman hunting, so I think responsible hunting, it doesn't do that much. So the, the key thing is by overpopulating and uh, over consuming, we're creating conditions for animals that we are then treating them in a certain way. So uh, I don't think uh, we should argue for complete elimination of animal use, at least in my opinion, right? So some hunting could be better, and hunting and always hunting is better 
then again buying meat, for example, somewhere in the supermarket. Because in a way, animal populations control themselves through the natural predator prey cycles, right? But but the but there's a difference between natural predator prey cycle and us generating a very different pressure on animal treatment and consumption. So I think those are two different things and we have to be careful to discriminate them and also not to alienate the same way people because frequently hunters are a very responsible animal. Uh, you know, li they like animals, they appreciate animals, at least the good hunters that I've met and I've known, uh, they are not just, uh, you know, kind of ignorant people, right? So in other words, we don't want to throw uh, what is this, the baby with a shower <laughs> water, <laughs> right? So we have to be careful. Uh, and maybe that's where it comes, right? Because in the end, humans have evolved as uh, omnivorous consumers, but as hunters, as a society, right? But also in the need of meat and hunting for food rather than for pleasure. And and the way that we're in hunting is, is serving pleasure, that's a different thing. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know human nature as well, but I think part of it is a big human nature, right? And our own psychology, our own biases, how we are uh, even self, uh, or the biases where people like to be in the group and whether they can sway, be swayed by any type of opinion, right? So global climate change is one big thing, but as you see now in the Western world, at least in the US, there's a very strong anti-sentiment because people say, well, we just don't believe it. There's just nothing there. So it just, we, it's, there's just nothing there, right? So they're convincing themselves that nothing is changing. So we had two years ago, we had the biggest snowfall. Uh, we had uh, five meters of snow in the mountains. That was one of the biggest snowfalls in 100 years. So it does happen, but now it happens more frequently. And I had people that will tell me, oh, see, we're globing warm. We see so much snow. Well, what they forgot to mention is we had four or five atmospheric rivers, which dumped all these things. And when I ask people, do you know what an atmospheric river is? Then people have no idea. And I say, why do you think? Why do you think that that can occur? People don't think about the connection of the warming oceans bringing all of these things, evaporating, coming in there, dumping, and then creating this boom or bust type of environmental conditions that is not just as good for skiing, but that's going to, again, I think it's more human psychology and us understanding, because we, uh, the more I think and grow and study humans, we are the most imperfect cognitively uh, beings. And for us, when we think that we are very unbiased, it's not true. We're very, very biased. And we need to be aware of those biases and we need to fight them. And unless you face those biases directly and discover them in yourselves, then we're going to fail. That's just my opinion, right? It's like implicit biases. We've heard about this. Everybody has them. When people say they are not biased, I just tell them to think again. So I, um, I'd like to connect this comment, or this topic, with the question about the drug dealers. <laughs> So I took the spirit of the comment which came from this direction of the room to be, look, um, you can say that the Bushmen are justified in hunting because they have families, it's a cultural tradition, they've done it for generations, and so long as they do it responsibly, they're feeding themselves and meeting basic human needs. But what we're thinking about at this conference is the things that they are hunting, which I take it are primates in some cases. Mostly not, but yeah, sometimes. Mostly not, but sometimes, right? So just think, let's just take those sometimes, right? The, the idea is those primates are more sophisticated mentally than we typically have thought they are. And you know what? Maybe it's just not right to kill them, even to feed ourselves, especially if we can imagine or provide people with a different source of food, right? So it doesn't seem like the end of the conversation to say, well, as long as you're hunting for sustenance, that's okay. That avoids the issue about the rights, if they have them, of the things being hunted. So I'd like to hear a little more conversation about whether it's really the case in Africa, choose the hardest case you want, that people there could not survive without killing primates. <laughs> okay, you saw me clinching my fingers. I would agree with you if you could say you have to keep your population level at a certain level. It was when you were sustainable. You have to not hunt with guns. You have to get rid of the antibiotics that is keeping you at a, a low level. It's just not a reality. You know, the Inuit are, or uh, any of the cultures that are coming up they're increasing their population as, as these way beyond carrying capacity, and they're using modern weapons. 
you know, basically they use shotguns and wire snares in Uganda. So it's not a, it's not a reasonable comparison. Yes, if that was possible, but it's not. And if you wanted to provide, you, you the Bushman's not a great example, if you wanted to provide a culture with uh, sustainable food levels, we're talking about a billion dollars for 100 square kilometers, something really outrageous to actually do it in Africa. It's just way, it, the logistics of doing that is way, really, really high. And then you're going to have to control population levels because you're going to have to say, okay, well, you could, we're going to feed you, but you can't have babies. And there's this whole bunch of moral things that are coming into that. So uh, that was my comment about thinking about, uh, you we have to think about, um, you know, kind of what's right for our culture, what's right for another culture. And we have to kind of, you know, think about uh, appropriateness and we have to think about logistics, that sort of thing. And sure, these cultures have a right to do these things, but it's my opinion, and I guess I'm going to just go up the line, that you know they have to do it in balance with what they're going to offtake. So you know, do we say they used to hunt chimpanzees, so it's fine now to hunt chimpanzees? We have to think about what we want to balance. You know, that means we would say that okay, you should hunt the last 350 mongrels. Should we do that? Maybe, maybe they're using us as a model. <laughs> maybe. We want what they have. Well, if we change, they might follow. Yep. I think we have to think about... The, com the comment which couldn't be white. heard was uh, maybe they're taking us as a model. There's, there's not a clear kind of uh, what's right and what's wrong. We have to think about what our end goal wants to be and what's a justifiable end goal. And we have to think about that for something bigger than kind of a, a culture that's trying to expand. And we have to think about that in tune to a culture like ours, which is way over exploiting. But how we balance those things, I don't know. Our cultures are tend to be really exploitative. So we're, we're using so much more resources. I drove up to a, a a church at a wedding, and I drive up at a four-wheel drive vehicle, which costs sixty thousand dollars a year, bringing huge amounts of petrol, and give a talk to a church group about not, you know, about not cutting down trees. It's totally ironic. It's, so we we have to we have to have some sort of balance, which I don't know what it is. So, so my, my question regards, um, I guess, the following thought experiments. Suppose we have a, a moral revolution, very good one. Tomorrow, everybody becomes vegan. Um, it's still the case that there are going to be many places where humans live in conflict with non-human animals, um, where their interests are opposed. Uh, research is one. So... Uh, depression has increased 30% over a recent time frame. I can't remember the, the period, but it's, it's increased quite a bit lately. There are a number of people I know working on drugs, new drugs, to help depression, and they use rodents for a variety of reasons. One, testing efficacy, another, testing safety. Even if we were all vegans tomorrow, there would be this issue of, is it worth killing X number of rats or mice to solve uh, an unknown, possibly zero, uh, number of humans if the drug ends up being a failure. Um, how does understanding sentience on, on a sort of a fine-grained scale help guide that moral decision-making? It, it's not entirely satisfying to hear the more complicated the animal, the more similar they are to us, the better they should be protected. No, but but perhaps that's that's one answer. I'm, so I'm just curious what the panel thinks about those, those questions. I've just been signaled that we have five minutes and I want to know, are you two waiting in line to ask questions or make comments? Stefan? 
Okay. I think it was a mistake to uh, distribute the questions and then distribute the commentators. It's, it's not converging, okay? Let's try to stick on one okay. line and then let the next person come in on it. Malcolm made a really good point there, and I I'd like to answer it. <laughs> yeah, but I can, I, yeah, I can, I, okay. I can try to say a little bit because it is a dilemma, and I completely agree with that, right? So the choice of model systems, in which case mice and rats, is partially justified because they do have, if we think about conscience or cognition, is by really short lifespan, right? So mice and rats live very short lives. So rat, I mean, if anybody had pet rats, it's really heartbreaking because they're very smart, but they die very quickly. And so hamsters, right? So in that way, uh, yes, to do progress, we, we do as a society potentially, or again, I think it's uh, up to an individual scientist to make the decision versus the society driving these things. I think the drive to abolish all research in animals is naive and it's not going to, and it should not happen. Uh, but at the same time, the questions uh, on the individual or maybe on committee levels, animal care committees, because all research in, within the Western society is regulated and the questions are regularly asked whether research you're doing is important. So in many cases, when research is funded, by national agencies, then reviewers have already given some answer to that, right? And so, uh, but I think choice of models should be justified. For example, I've seen cases, now again, maybe it's hypocritical or not, but I've seen cases where the same work can be done on dogs or on mice. And somebody said, I want to do them on dogs because I like to do to work on dogs because I work on them before. So the question is, is it justified or not? In my eyes, it's not. Because if you can address the same thing and produce exactly the same answer, then you should use a shorter lived animal potentially, uh, but I may be wrong. That's just that's my kind of a thing that I accept for myself, right? But uh, uh, but I yeah, but I do think animal I mean animal research in some ways does benefit not just society but animals as well in terms of veterinarian help or in trying even to understand animals because mechanisms, including mechanism of cognition, are very critical for us to understand this. We cannot assume that the animals are black boxes, so we can only do certain things. But we do have to be very careful, I think, which species we choose to work uh, and uh, how many we sacrifice, right? Those numbers should be justified. We can't just, to address some little thing, we shouldn't be, you know, maybe killing 2,000 rats instead of our 100 rats. But I also think this thing's already happening. So again, uh, working with the committees, we are already asking these questions of, of people, if you apply to National uh, Institute of Health in the United States, you are supposed to justify number of animals. You're writing a special section which you have to address, and that's fair. So in that way, we are making progress. The same with the National Science Foundation, right? So as long as we are consciously thinking about these questions, we are debating them, we're discussing them, we are making progress just, just by doing so, I think. Okay, so I asked you your criterion before and you just gave it, so thanks for the criterion. Uh, but this is actually not a, this is not a vegan summer school. There are lots of vegans here, I'm one of them, but it's not a vegan summer school. It was never the principle of this summer school that we couldn't have, uh, that, that we couldn't have non-vegans here or that we couldn't have research that was done on animals. Otherwise, lots of the people that spoke here couldn't have spoken here. So it's not, uh, one of the premises that is under scrutiny here is not whether we should abolish scientific research. Let's stop talking about it. That's not a premise here. I may have my feelings about it, but it's not part of this. And the other one that's not a premise of this, of this, uh, of this summer school is that everybody should become a vegan. I may have my views about that, but that's not it either. And that's why it's a complete red herring, but a complete red herring to bring up Bushman practices. A complete red herring. Because what, what, what the principles that were discussed over here to the, to the extent that vegan, veganism was even touched on, it was referring to us and our possibilities and not those. Malcolm added one other factor, and it's more general than scientific research and food, and that's conflict of interest. You, as biologists, you all know that there, there, there are predators and there's prey, and that's, that's a fact of life that even vegans can't abolish. They can say everything's equal, every living creature is equal, but it doesn't work that way. We're not trying to abolish that. There are conflicts of interest, and we're not trying to resolve all conflicts of interest. You have a conflict of interest, um, Vlodya, and you gave roughly what your criteria are. I'd rather have fewer lower animals in some way than more, okay, fine. That's not what's under scrutiny over here. What's under scrutiny is, 
for the part that we probably all agree on, right? We require a certain sensitivity to the needs of sentient creatures. And that's why we're even bringing in the vole people in order to be able to understand better the sensitivity to these sentient creatures. So please, vegans, forget about the world vegan agenda for the moment. And anti-research anti people, that's not what's at issue over here either. Now I hand it over to Kat. I just want to mention something because you said we have, um, you know, if you get funding for your research, then this is justified. I think it's not that easy because, um, it, on, for example, NIH um, applications, they don't really ask much um, information. That's just from my personal experience. So I, I wouldn't, I think everybody, like, I don't know if you know the book um, by Richard Harris, it's called Rigor Mortis. And it's, I recommend this to everybody to read this because it's about the biomedical um, industry. And um, it, it shows, I mean, everybody knows that it's in a deep crisis, but they, it's an industry. So of course they try to cover it up. And um, it's a very well done book by uh, the science journalist and he interviews researchers. Um, they speak out on the issues the industry has. And um, at the moment, I think the public doesn't really know what's going on. And it's, it's this prestige thing that only scientists know what's good for, for everybody. But we have to have an open discussion about this. So, yeah. Well, I completely agree. That I, that I, I think that, that when I said we're making a progress, because the discussion is being held. So at any stage is being, I mean, I've been at NIH panels, I've been at NSF panels, I've been in animal care committees for research. The disc trust me, at least where I work, the discussion is serious. We, no, nobody's rubber stamping anything, at least where I've been. And, and I, it's, people are, again, I've reviewed multiple grants and uh, many people I know take it seriously and they do review it very carefully, which means if, if anything, it's at least a start, right? It's a, it's a move in the right direction. But, but do you see, really see a, cha a change? I mean, the numbers are rising of animals used, and I don't see the change, you know. We, we might be starting to talk about it, but there's no... Well, it's hard to tell about changes because for that we need statistics, and I don't have uh, access to numbers in, in terms of the, the numbers. But I think change is, the ch change is there in attitude, uh, in, in what maybe Stephen's saying, right? How people feel about these issues and how people discuss it. Change is happening because chimpanzees are no longer uh, allowed in kind of high in these sorts of research. That, and they're decreasing the types of animals that are used. Yeah, but then rats and mice are not even covered, uh, like protected under the Animal Welfare Act in the United States, just as an example. And they are as sentient as dogs. So there is still a lot to be done. And I think the public has to be informed to help push because otherwise it's not going to be as fast of a change because it's an, it has, it's an industry, it has its own interests. Everybody has a self-interest in sustaining this industry. So, I'd like to express my appreciation to all of you that asked questions and especially to Colin and Vladimir and Jonathan for their thoughts. We're going to break now and I invite you back for the evening session. Thank you very much. Those are hard questions.